Good morning. My name is Susie Brown. I'm the Public Policy Director at the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. We're delighted that you've joined us this morning for a discussion about lobbying, the laws, and reporting requirements that are related to lobbying. Um, we'd first like to start by sharing with you a little bit about public policy at the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. In our role, we support individual nonprofits and Minnesota's nonprofit sector to be their own voice in the public policy process. And that's one of the reasons we're delighted that you've joined us for this training. Um, and also, we provide training on lobbying and advocacy and serve as a resource to policymakers on the nonprofit sector. And we advocate on issues that impact all nonprofits, such as incentives to charitable giving, nonprofit tax exemptions, lobbying rights, and election activities. We've got a really great and dynamic mix of nonprofit advocacy trainings and events coming up for you in 2014 that are going to take you through from the legislative session through the elections. Um, these events will include webinars, a lot like today's. Um, some in-person events uh, will be at the Capitol for the Capitol Lab. We'll have a few opportunities to meet with elected officials and their staff. And at all of these, well, except for the webinars, there are opportunities for some really great networking with your public policy peers or in, and to learn from what others are doing. The next webinar coming up is a week from today, and it's on understanding the state budget. You can register today through the link at the bottom of this slide. Today's presenters will be MCN's public policy staff. Again, I'm Susie Brown. I'm the public policy director. And you just heard from Renal Ray, who is our public policy advocate. We are the public policy staff both on today's, present, on today's webinar and also the people that you can contact at any time for assistance or questions about any of these training topics. And our contact information is at the end of this slideshow. There really is four things that we want you to get out of today. One is to really think about and consider the importance of nonprofit lobbying. Also, we want you to make sure you know the definition of lobbying and related terms and understanding the laws that are related to nonprofit lobbying at the federal and state level and understand the reporting and tracking requirements that goes along with those um, laws. We encourage you to send in your questions throughout the webinar. Really want to be responsive to what you want to know, and we can't know that unless you tell us. So feel free to shoot your questions in through the chat feature. I'll be keeping track of them, and we'll get to them um, at the end or throughout our presentation. Also, feel free to join us on Twitter through hashtag yes, you can without the exclamation points, and follow us at Smart Nonprofits. Thanks, and all. And now we will shift into the content. Um, but I'd really like to emphasize, Renal just suggested that you can send your questions in throughout the webinar. We appreciate that. In particular, at this point, I'd like you to think about sending in any questions related to today's learning objectives. If there are specific things you wanted to learn today that you don't see on our list, the importance of nonprofit lobbying, the definitions and related terms, the laws, and the reporting requirements. If there are specific things that you were hoping to get out of this webinar that you don't see on that list, please do feel free to send those in through the chat at this point. Thanks. So first of all, we thought we would just start with a little overview of why nonprofits lobby and why they should lobby. Um, some of you probably are lobbying already and are here for a refresher. Others might be thinking about getting into it, and yet others still might wonder if this is even okay. Um, we'd like to start just with an overview of the importance of this activity for nonprofit organizations in our sector. First of all, it's really important to consider the fact that lobbying really brings the voice of your organization and its constituents to the policymaking dialogue. If we just think a little bit about, well, right now in the state of Minnesota, if you read the paper, you can see that the legislative session is really going in full force. And there are many, many, many issues which may be relevant to your organization or the constituency you serve um, or important to the well-being of the community in which you're located. If, the, if those voices and concerns are not brought into the policymaking dialogue, there's really something missing. And we believe that it's essential to think about how your organization and your constituency can contribute as these dialogues are occurring. 
second reason why it's really important that nonprofits lobby is that both good and bad things that happen in policymaking are influenced by lobbying. That's just a fact. There are lots of lobbyists at the Capitol, and they are influencing things. And good and bad things, that's a judgment. Do you think it's good? Does somebody else think it's bad? Um, but all of the things that happen there are influenced by lobbying. And if, it's influ if these things are influenced by lobbying that doesn't include the voices of the nonprofit sector or the constituents they serve, then in your judgment of how things work out in the end, you might think that it's more bad things that have happened. Um, we'd like to see involvement from the nonprofit sector in a way that nonprofits and the communities they serve can evaluate the decisions at the end and recognize that things are good for the sector, good for organizations and the people they serve. Finally, legislators would tell you that they really need input from the public in order to develop good public policies. Ideas come to the legislature through a variety of paths, um, and they're thoroughly vetted. They need to understand the pros and cons. They need data. They need stories. They need to consider um, a variety of things as they develop ideas into public policy. Legislators get public input through lobbying and through engaging the community in the process. So we really recommend that you think about these three things. It's a way to bring the voice of your organization and your constituents. Um, good and bad things happen because of the influence of lobbying, and ideas are developed into good public policy through public input as reasons that your nonprofit should be um, thinking about and planning to get involved in lobbying. Frequently at the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, we hear that nonprofits aren't involved in lobbying or avoid lobbying for some reasons that tend to be common themes, some of which we'll address today. Primarily, there's a misunderstanding throughout the sector that the law does not allow nonprofits to lobby. So that's really the content of today's webinar, and we hope that the extent to which that misunderstanding is prevalent in your organization, um, we can help to correct that. And we really believe that spreading the word that nonprofits are allowed to law is a critical way to expand the voice of our sector. A second concern sometimes that occurs in nonprofits is that lobbying is inappropriate. And if we read the news and look at maybe things happening in Washington, we can actually find things that would be evidence that there's something maybe inappropriate or unbecoming about lobbying, um, because the things that show up in the news are the stories of things gone wrong. Um, but lobbying is just an activity. It's an activity that brings voice and influence to the policymaking process. It isn't inappropriate. It's not unbecoming the nonprofit sector. It's an activity that we should embrace as an important way to advance our mission. And the third thing that we commonly hear is that nonprofit organizations don't have a process to develop positions on issues. And that's a really real and valid concern. And it's one that actually we're not going to address in today's webinar, but we hope that we can help you if that's the barrier in your organization. Um, there's a training on July 10th. You'll see that on the list um, on an earlier slide. It's not a webinar. It's an in-person training, three hours. It's um, working with your board on policy planning. And that's the upcoming training where we'll talk about this particular issue, but we also invite your organization to contact either of us anytime if you'd like assistance in thinking about developing a process. At this point, we also would invite you to send in to the chat any other things that you've experienced in your organization that exist as barriers to lobbying. Um, things that we could address either in this webinar today or in future trainings. So what is lobbying? Um, as I mentioned before, it, it has a variety of connotations and kind of images in the public, but let's just get down to what it really is. Lobbying is an attempt to influence specific legislation, period. There's a comma there, but let's just stop there for a second, period. Lobbying is an attempt to influence specific legislation. So an idea is out there. It's moving as legislation. We're for it or against it, or maybe we're neutral. 
um, and lobbying is a way that we want to influence its outcome. Digging down a little bit deeper, I'd like to just uh, identify that lobbying can be done in two different ways. One is called direct and one is called grassroots, and this is relevant to the future discussion in this webinar about the laws and reporting. Direct lobbying is, uh, is the picture with the handshake on the upper left. Direct lobbying is a communication directly with a legislator or policymaker in which a view is expressed on specific legislation. One way to think about direct lobbying is the person that you're talking to is the decision maker. They have a vote. They are a person in a position um, to actually weigh into the policymaking. In many cases in Minnesota, that would be a state legislator, a member of the House or Senate. Grassroots lobbying, on the other hand, is the, is the megaphone picture. <laughs> Grassroots lobbying is communication with the general public in which a view is expressed and the public is called to action to contact or influence policymakers. So I bet you all get lots of emails in your inbox every day from the organizations, the advocacy organizations that you uh, that work on issues that you care about, whether it's the Sierra Club or the um, whatever. Lots of different organizations. And uh, from time to time, their emails have a call to action. They say, please contact your legislator and ask them to do X. In fact, you'll get those emails from time to time from the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. That is grassroots lobbying, and that's when we're asking the general public to do the work of talking to that person in the other picture, the person who actually has the vote on the issue. So what is not lobbying? Um, and the one, two, three, four, five, six bullet points here are what we have defined in federal law that is not lobbying for the purposes of nonprofit organizations. Now, there are other definitions of lobbying related to state laws we're gonna talk about a little bit later and some of these may differ a little bit, but for the purposes of you are a 501c3 nonprofit, you are subject to the rules and regulations and laws related to the IRS, um, these are the things that the IRS has determined is not lobbying. Communications on proposed regulations or administrative rulemaking, Communications with members, this deals with specifically with member organizations, nonprofits that have members in a formal way. The Minnesota Council of Nonprofits has members, all of you, I suspect, are members. Um, but many other nonprofits don't have members, they serve the general public. Um, and so communications with the general public would be considered grassroots lobbying, but communications with your members would not. Technical advice. So for example, if you have expertise in an area and a legislator says, um, help me understand how this proposed healthcare law is going to influence the immigrant community that you serve, help them with technical advice, that's not lobbying. Self-defense is um, also not lobbying and that is self-defense for your organizational well-being or for your organization's ability to continue to do its work in the community. Now there are all kinds of things which you could consider to be threats to your organization's ability to do its work, like um, a decrease in funding or um, regulations that require you to get a new kind of licensing or whatever. Those things are not self-defense. Self-defense is really things that get at the absolute core of your organization's existence. So for example, if they decided to do away with 501c3 organizations, we would all rush to our legislators in self-defense that our organizations should exist. That's the, the level of thing that is self-defense, um, considered not lobbying. Nonpartisan analysis or research. Um, the Minnesota Budget Project is an example, one of our programs is an example of a nonprofit analytical and research program where there's a lot of information put out about the state budget, um, but if it doesn't have a point of view about specific legislation or a call to action, it's not considered lobbying. And discussion of broad policy issues without a specific 
legislative proposal that's being considered. So an organization could say, you know, we believe in um, health care for all, but if there's no health care for all proposal, and in fact what we're really talking about these days is the Affordable Care Act and Minsure and, and medical assistance, those are the specific issues to say we believe in health care for all is a broad policy issue not considered lobbying. So the reason it's important to think about what's not lobbying is because very shortly we will get into um, the laws that govern our lobbying and the ways that we need to report. So we need to keep in mind these things as activities which do not count in um, as we think about the laws and the reporting requirements. Oops, I think I went ahead. It's not lobbying. Okay. Just briefly, uh, I'd like to uh, talk about a couple of related terms. So lobbying is a specific attempt to influence legislation. Um, advocacy is a term, though, that you'll often hear. We use it frequently here at the Council of Nonprofits. And advocacy is a term that really represents a broad range of strategies, which could include lobbying as one of them to advance a cause. So if you think about how movements are built or causes are developed and advanced, there are a whole bunch of different things that go into successfully changing policy. So one of them is lobbying, direct your grassroots, um, but some of the other kinds of things include um, grassroots organizing, communications tactics such, such as the, um, I guess those are bus stop billboards on the right, um, issue analysis and issue briefs, monitoring legislation, working with the media on things like op-eds or opinion pieces, letters to the editor. There are a whole bunch of advocacy activities which go into advancing a cause, only one of which is lobbying. I want to just make it clear that all advocacy activities are allowed for nonprofit organizations and only lobbying specifically lobbying, has limits and reporting requirements. And this slide is one where I hope if your organization has some particular reasons why they're not interested in engaging in lobbying, then one of the things you can think about is, well, what are the other ways that we can advance the causes that we're concerned about? And then eventually work on the things that are barriers to lobbying, such as learning about the laws, developing a way to take positions on issues, learning about the reporting requirements that will help you add that to the broad range of advocacy activities that will advance your cause. A couple of other related terms that um, we're not going to talk about anymore in this training, but they um, seem worth bringing up. One is electioneering, and electioneering is actually the attempt to influence the outcome of an election, either influencing which party wins or which candidate wins. Electioneering is not allowed by 501c3 organizations, ever. It's strictly prohibited. It's not our work. We are nonpartisan organizations that do lots of important advocacy and policy, lobbying, um, but we do not get involved in elections, ever. If you have questions about that, um, please don't hesitate to call us. And as we approach the 2014 election, which will be a big deal in Minnesota, all of the members of the Minnesota House, all of the members of the Congressional delegation, the House, um, Senate, one of the Senate offices and all of the statewide offices will be up. As we approach that election, we'll do some training on what activities are allowed near elections, um, but steering clear of electioneering. Also, just because it's been in, in our lives in Minnesota in recent years, I wanted to call attention to ballot measure questions. So as you recall, in 2012, there were two ballot measure questions, one related to same-sex marriage one related to photo ID for voting. And you might have recognized that many, many nonprofit organizations worked on those issues. Ballot measure questions, working on those issues, is considered direct lobbying. So even though ballot measure questions are on the ballot with the candidates and the parties where we're not supposed to touch that stuff, if you think about the definition of direct lobbying, that you're trying to influence the person who has a vote, that's why ballot measure questions are allowed and considered direct lobbying activity. So essentially, 
if the Minnesota legislature, which has 201 people who can vote on each issue, and our direct lobbying is talking to those 201 people, in ballot measure questions, we're basically just turning our direct lobbying activity to the general voting public because each of us had a vote and it was totally appropriate that nonprofit organizations try to influence that vote as direct lobbying. It's not electioneering and it's not grassroots lobbying. And if more ballot measure questions come up in Minnesota, um, we'll certainly provide additional training on how to appropriately get involved in that activity. So we've been through an overview of why it's important, what are some of the barriers, what are some of the important terms to keep track of, and now we'll switch to Renal and she'll talk about the laws that govern lobbying for nonprofits, and following that we'll talk about reporting requirements. As Susie mentioned already, there are different laws at both the federal and state level that govern lobbying for nonprofits. Um, and we're really focusing a lot of this webinar more on your organization as a 501c3, but we've included resources for you um, to find out a little bit more about Minnesota specifically as well. So for the federal laws, in the Internal Revenue Code Section 501c3, it specifically says that no substantial part of the activities of an organization um, should be carrying on propaganda or otherwise attempting to influence legislation, except as otherwise provided in subsection H. Um, so that's kind of the default rule, that a 501c3 organization cannot spend a substantial amount of their resources on lobbying. Um, there's also an exception, not an exception, um, but an election to this H election that we'll talk about in a little bit, but that's kind of the default rule. And I think partially this is why some organizations or people get confused about whether nonprofits can lobby or not. Um, if anybody ever asks you or says to you, I've heard that nonprofits can lobby, you say, in Section 501c3, it says that they can't do a substantial amount, but that doesn't say that nonprofits cannot lobby. So, and then going on to state law, um, <clears throat> State law requires that an entity, nonprofits or otherwise including businesses and other community groups that lobby in Minnesota have to report their activities for public disclosure, but there are no limits um, in state law. This is more of a, they want sunshine on what organizations and businesses are doing in terms of their lobbying activity, um, but don't necessarily, are not necessarily limiting that activity. So understanding the limits, so we know from the Internal Revenue Code that there are some limits and that nonprofits aren't supposed to spend a substantial amount, but what exactly does that mean? Um, in, in the federal law, no substantial amount is not necessarily defined. It establishes a limit, but there isn't really any further clarity on what those limits are. Here's what we do know. We know that it is activity-based under the no substantial part test, um, that substantial is not defined, that in um, IRS Form 990, which nonprofits have to complete annually, in Schedule C, um, lobbying is also not defined. But they ask you, they will ask organizations who choose to go this way for detailed descriptions of their activities. Um, and it's also kind of what you'll hear related to the no substantial part test is that it's a facts and circumstances examination. So really what this means is that it's going to be case specific. They're going to weigh different factors and circumstances of an organization against one another and against other cases and that there's really not a bright line test. Here's what you need to know about the no substantial part test, that it's pretty vague and it's kind of uncertain. There's another way to understand the limits of nonprofit lobbying, and that's through the 501H election. The H election sets pretty clear limits. It provides definitions of lobbying. It provides really clear expenditure tests, and we'll kind of take a look at what those limits are in a little bit. Um, and it also defines those grassroots and direct lobbying. Let me give you an example of how these two tests are different. If you take one of your 
volunteers at your nonprofit or a board member who's also a volunteer and have them or ask them to go and talk to a legislator on a specific issue. Under the no substantial part test, you would most likely have to report that activity because that's an activities-based test. Under the 501H election, you probably would not because no money was spent by the organization for a volunteer to go and lobby. So that just is one example that highlights the difference between the two tests. Um, all right, so choosing the H election. Um, this is a really, this, cho deciding what's right for your organization if you decide to go with the H election, can be a really good conversation at your organization. There are advantages and disadvantages to each choice. Um, for example, for some very large organizations, budget-wise, um, they might find the $1 million cap kind of burdensome and would prefer the vagueness of the insubstantial part test. Um, other smaller organizations or mid-sized organizations really prefer the clarity um, and the bright line of the 501H election. So once you've had that conversation within your organization and decide which way to go, the H election is really simple. It's super easy, and that's what triggers a specific reporting calculation. I should note that there are some organizations that are disqualified from the H election, such as churches, associations of churches, and private foundations, but most charitable nonprofits under 501c3 are eligible. So let's take a look at this form. Oops, I skipped ahead. All right, this is literally all that you have to fill out. It's this first half of the form. It's super short, super easy. Once you fill it out and send it in, um, the election takes, is in effect until you actively revoke it. The second half of the form are really good instructions um, and clarify what you need to do moving forward. It's just a one-page form. And then here's, here are the lobbying expenditure limits. Um, is, you can tell that it's pretty clear. Um, up to $500,000 of your annual exempt purpose expenditures, um, total direct lobbying is, can be 20% of that. And then a quarter of that total direct lobbying expenditure um, can be allocated to grassroots lobbying. And Susie will talk to us a little bit on how you keep track of what activity or what expenditures, excuse me, fall under which category. Um, and there's a really great online calculator where you can plug in your organization's um, expenditures and lobbying and it'll tell you where your limits are under the H election that we've linked to at the end of this PowerPoint. Now okay. turn it back to Susie. Thanks, Renal. So I hope what you take away from the conversation about the laws that govern lobbying for nonprofits is that this is an activity that's allowable and there are limits and each organization has an opportunity to have a conversation internally about whether you'd like your organization to be subject to the substantial amount test, which as Renal said is an activities-based test of your lobbying, or the H election, which gives a bright line dollar amount. If in the brief discussion of these things, this raises more questions than answers, please don't hesitate to either send a question into the chat or contact us after this webinar for additional information. So next we'll talk about reporting requirements. And I'll get into the specifics, but first I'd like to just start kind of at the high up level in thinking about who wants to know when we lobby and why. And who wants to know triggers reporting requirements. Basically, there are two entities that care about lobbying, and they care for very different reasons. And so the lobbying reporting requirements then end up being different. The federal government, the IRS, cares because as 501c3 organizations, we've entered into an agreement with them, essentially, that says, in exchange for a benefit that our organization gets, which is tax deductibility of donations, we will voluntarily limit our activities in this area. 
We will limit our lobbying and actually we will agree to do no electioneering. I want to just call out that this is different than our friends in the 501c4 world because they actually don't have the same arrangement with the federal government. The 501c4 organizations do not get tax deductibility for donations and thus they do not have the same limits on lobbying or exclusions on electioneering activity. So the federal government cares about how much we lobby because we're in this exchange that has to do with our donors and tax deductibility. The state government cares for an entirely different reason. Really all they care about is transparency. They really just want to know, they, they want to make information available so that the public knows how much money is spent and by whom for influencing elected officials and influencing elections. So the interest of the state government, which comes out of Minnesota public policymaking, is entirely about what we call sunshine, basically shining a light on activities and resources that have influence in our political or public policy making process. And the entity that governs that and to whom we are accountable is called the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. And they have oversight and we are accountable to them around both lobbying activities and election related activities, but we'll only talk about lobbying activities because we're not allowed to do the other stuff. First, I'll talk about federal reporting requirements. Um, if you were in the room, I'd say raise your hand if you're an accountant for your organization, <laughs> and I bet it would be very few people who are accountants. And raise your hand if you are the organization's executive director or public policy advocate or public policy thinker, um, and that's probably more of you. But the federal reporting requirements actually are a function of the accounting side or the finance side of our organizations. We need to report on the Form 990. It's called Schedule C. That's where we report our lobbying activities or expenses, depending on whether we have an H election. What we report if we're an H elector is the amount of money spent on lobbying. I should have added here um, what we report if we're not an H elector is our activities. Um, and also we are required in our federal reporting to provide a breakdown of the amount that we spend or the amount of activities that are direct and the amount that, are, that is grassroots. So they care about whether we're talking directly to legislators or policymakers, or whether we're communicating with the public. The Form 990 is done once a year. Um, if you're not the accountant or the chief finance person, um, you may not know that much about it, but that person um, does that very diligently every year and will need to add Schedule C to their Form 990 if, they, if your organization engages in lobbying. This is just a snapshot of the Schedule C. Um, you can see on the top that it asks for political ca campaign and lobbying activities. And you might be saying to yourself, but we can't engage in political campaigns. But this form is actually used for both 501c3 and 501c4 organizations. Um, so 501c4s might answer some of these questions differently. Um, and also, this is a place where if we made an oops and we got involved in election activities, we would need to put it here. Um, this is a four-page schedule. It's not a big deal, but it does require that you've kept track throughout the year in order to have the data you'll need to complete this form. You can look at the rest of this form by just Googling what you see across the top, IRS Form 990 Schedule C. Okay, so we know that the state reporting requirements differ, and I'll share with you a few key ways that that is so. Um, the state, report, state requires us to submit lobbyist reports multiple times a year after we meet a lobbying threshold and we register. So there are a few things packed into that. Um, one thing about the campaign finance report is that, as I mentioned before, really they just care about the flow of money and the amount of money and by whom. But if you're doing a minimal amount, then 
that actually doesn't register with them. It doesn't, it doesn't really count. So lobbyists need to register as a lobbyist, just sending in a simple paper to the state, and then they become a part of the reporting system only after earning or spending $3,000. So essentially, if your salary, if, if you add up the work that you've done and it adds up to $3,000 or more of your salary, then you'll need to register as a lobbyist and that triggers the reporting requirements. Campaign finance reports occur multiple times a year after you've met the threshold and um, not at the same time as your 990. So between these two entities, you'll be reporting probably four times a year. Um, the campaign finance in the state is also different in that you report your numbers through your organization. So when the public sees where the money is flowing, in our case, they'll see that the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits spent X amount of mo mo money lobbying, and Susie and Renal and some others here were the people who did that work. So you report it through the organization, but actually individual lobbyists are subject to state lobbying laws after they become registered. There's no such thing related to the IRS that affects individuals. The IRS, our relationship with the IRS is entirely related to our organization. But in the state of Minnesota, if an individual lobbyist um, breaks a law, then they are personally liable and subject to the penalties. And important things to know are that individual lobbyists, so once, you know, for me, once my salary hit $3,000 in doing this work, I registered, that there's a strict limit on making political contributions during the legislative session. And if you think about that for just a minute, you can imagine why that is. The law is intended to um, essentially reduce buying of influence. Um, and then another thing to note is that legislators or candidates for legislative office are limited in how much they can accept in campaign contributions from registered lobbyists. And so every time a registered lobbyist makes a political contribution, they need to report that as something, they need to report to the candidate that they are a lobbyist. So that candidate can count up how much they're getting from the lobbying community, and then they can say no thank you when they've hit their limit. So it's really important to be aware not, don't, don't be concerned about this or afraid of this, it's not a big deal, but be really aware that the state and federal requirements are different in that individuals are subject to the lobby laws in the state of Minnesota. As Renal mentioned earlier, um, it's noteworthy that the state doesn't care how much we do. They want to know how much we do, but unlike the IRS, they don't, they don't care if we lobby, if we spend all of our money lobbying. That's not their point. They don't regulate us in that way. In fact, they don't care if we're a 501c3 or a 501c4 or a church or a business or an unincorporated group. They just want to know everybody's expenses. So you will never have a conversation with the state campaign finance board that has anything to do with 501c3 lobby limits. They don't care. Okay, so in order to do this, um, compliance with the federal limits and also with state and federal reporting requirements, we have to figure out how to keep track. And this is something that can be a headache at best for lobbyists and organizations, um, but really with some cross-departmental careful thinking, um, I believe, and we have experienced here at MCN, can be manageable and um, shouldn't get in the way of people carrying out this work. Essentially, there's no recipe for success in how to keep track of your lobbying. But each organization needs to develop their own method that makes sense for their organization and how they do their accounting and how they do their scheduling and calendars and such. The method that you create needs to make sense for your organization, and it needs to have a rationale that would be understood essentially by somebody from the outside who's looking into your organization, an auditor, a board member, a regulating entity, or other stakeholders. 
There's no perfect or uniform method, but organizations must keep track of the time spent, the cost of that time, and the incidental expenses that support lobbying in order to be successful in reporting both to the IRS and the Campaign Finance Board. At the end of this webinar, we have a slide that has some resources on it, and I'd like to call your attention to one called Keeping Track, which is um, developed by the Alliance for Justice, which is a national organization um, that has thought an awful lot about this, and they're all lawyers, so um, they get it right. Um, and they have a 20-ish page document that really talks about how your organization might approach this. What I would recommend is that this is a conversation that's between different departments in your organization, including whoever's going to do the policy work and whoever does the finance work and the accounting. Um, that's how we do it in our organization. It's a good um, cross-departmental collaboration, and it helps us be practical and realistic about when we're doing this work, how to keep track of it, and it also helps us be compliant and accountable when it's time to do our reporting so that the numbers add up and they make sense and they're rational and defensible. I'll just call your attention very briefly to a couple of methods that um, we've seen people use, that we've used internally here at MCN, and that the Alliance for Justice highlights in their Keeping Track document. One would be keeping track through timesheets. Now, not everyone is a timesheet organization. Often that depends on whether you're exempt or non-exempt employees, or it depends on whether you have grants or funding sources that require you to keep timesheets. But if you are a timesheet organization, then working with your accounting people, your human resource people on the timesheet to be able to have some sort of trigger or tracker or something that you can indicate on your timesheet when it's a lobbying activity could be a very straightforward way for timesheet-based organizations to keep track by using a system that's already in place. Another method, which is the one that we tend to use here at MCN, is more of the Outlook calendar method, where we, we're very diligent. We have very full calendars here at MCN. And um, we put on our calendars to kind of live on in perpetuity in our outlook the work that we're doing that's lobbying related. So we, then we can, each of us individually, go back um, daily, weekly, monthly, um, periodically when the reports are due and be able to really see with detail on our outlook calendars when we did these activities and how much time they took. Another way would be to use daily or weekly logs where you could create a method internally that has a, a worksheet or some sort of computer-based log where you just um, click in or write in every time you do this kind of activity um, to keep track of the hours spent and then the relationship you'll need to have with your accounting or human resource department is how does the time that you're keeping track of tie to the cost incurred by the organization, which would include costs associated with salaries, benefits, overhead, and other, other general costs that are tied to, um, to salaries in your organization. So as I say there, include salaries, benefits, overhead costs, and establishing the cost of time spent in lobbying. So there are a variety of ways to do this. I highly recommend that you take 15 minutes to look at that Keeping Track document um, at the conclusion of this webinar. If you have questions, we're nearing the end of our webinar, and we would love to hear some questions from you if you have them. Um, but meanwhile, we'd like to suggest that it is your turn to get started. So we really encourage that you use the information in today's webinar to um, address some of the things that might have been barriers in your organization, understanding the law, thinking about how to track and report appropriately. We hope that this has helped to break down some barriers so you can become a lobbying organization. Um, in the meantime, we believe that it's really important that legislators hear about the good work that's happening in the community that they serve. So we would like to suggest, and we've asked um, executive directors of organizations to do this a week ago when the session started, um, but ask that you consider um, taking, I don't know, what would it take or not, 15 minutes maybe, yep. to um, send two letters today um, one to your House member, one to the 
person from the Senate who represents you, um, who represents the district in which your organization is located. There's a template on there in the second bullet point, and above that is the legislative district finder. In the template, we suggest that you say to them, um, this is our organization, we are in your community, our, the people we serve are your constituents, um, this is the work that we do. We want you to be aware of the importance of this organization in your community as you do your work at the legislature. So think about doing that today. It'll be fun. And your legislators will know about you. So then when you go to lobby them, um, it won't be an introduction for the first time. A second thing to do is think about attending a nonprofit day on the Hill. Um, I happen to know through my Facebook feed that today is Mental Health Day on the Hill and Homelessness Day on the Hill, so at 11 o'clock when you're done with this call, if you want to get in your car, grab a sandwich on the way, run to the Capitol, you can participate in those, and it's a beautiful day in St. Paul. And Rinald, do you want to talk a little bit about the Days on the Hill on our website? Sure. If your organization is planning a day on the Hill or you want to find out more about who's doing what when in terms of nonprofit organization Days on the Hill, we've got a section of our website kind of dedicated to a calendar of nonprofit days on the Hill. If you'd like to submit your information, all you have to do is email me with the date, the name of your event, and a website or some more information that I can link to. It's a really good resource to find out who's got what going on. Okay, um, please send questions if you have them, and um, if we finish up before 11, if there aren't questions, then we'll just be done a little bit early. But first I wanted to call your attention to a few resources that we hope are helpful. Um, you can see the H election. Is that what that first one is, Renal? Yeah. IRS Form 5768, yeah. <laughs> otherwise known as the H election form. Um, Minnesota Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. There's the Alliance for Justice Keeping Track document. We have a legal handbook. Um, that's available to members only, mm -hmm. and um, you can see the state laws and the federal laws there. Um, there's a non lobbying and advocacy handbook by Marcia Abner, my predecessor here at MCN, and we have a number of public policy and advocacy resources on our website. But maybe most importantly for additional resources is us. We're here to help you. Uh, we really would like to be useful in um, a way that's directly applicable to your organization. So please don't hesitate to call or email. We're happy to chat with you. We also are very willing to come out to your organization and talk to your staff or your board um, and help you dig into some of these issues. We have a question. Uh, Mark. Um. We have a question from Kizzy about whether this webinar will be available on our website. Uh, we will upload a recording to our YouTube channel, um, and I will be sending a link to that later today. Any other questions? Send them in. In the meantime, Susie, I have a question oh, for sure. you. Um, I see at the bottom of the PowerPoint slides, there's a picture of you with Al Franken on the far left, and kind of in the middle, there's a picture of a nonprofit member, a young person, um, with Rick Nolan at an MCN event. Is it okay for nonprofit staff to take pictures with elected officials and have them as a part of their marketing? Well, sure, and I can also talk about whether this was lobbying. Um, so both of these pictures are from events that we hold called Coffee with Congress. Actually, we're about to launch our 2014 Coffee with Congress. We'll send you information about those events when they come to your community. We hope you come. They're super fun. Um, and some of these people are really funny. Um, so this is a completely fine thing to do. Um, we encourage you to invite legislators to your office and to show them around or to introduce them to the people that you serve. Um, Coffee with Congress is our way to introduce members of the United States Congress and Senate to our members and allow them to ask questions of the members of Congress. So um, two questions in this, one with the one with Senator Franken on the left and me holding the microphone. Um, that wasn't lobbying. Really, that was just a community event opportunity. Now, if the purpose of that event was to press Senator Franken to take action on a particular issue, if we said, 
please come and talk to our um, members because they want to encourage you to vote for blah, blah, blah. Then that event would have been a lobbying expense if the content of the event was completely focused on that. Actually, the content of the event was entirely focused on what questions do you have, nonprofit folks, for the senator, and what does he want to tell us about the work that's happening that is among his priorities. Um, so you can do that um, as long as you want. No limits, no reporting. Um, similarly, the one on the right is, Senate, is um, Congressman Rick Nolan. The woman in the middle, in the yellow and the scarf, is a member of a nonprofit organization. And the young person is one of the people that they serve in a youth-serving organization. So this was his opportunity to come to an event with a member of Congress and meet the, meet the member and talk about what he cares about in the community. In either case, it's okay for us to use those images um, in our promotional materials, as we're doing here. As we get closer to elections, we need to be thinking more carefully about the extent to which we highlight certain candidates for office, and um, we just need to think strategically and carefully about to what extent using um, promotional photos of legislators who might be running for office might be misconstrued as election activity. So again, we'll have some trainings on this kind of thing as we get closer to the November election. Yep, there is a question from Karen on where uh, we can find the keeping track form from the Alliance for Justice. Great. So some people on this call are on the phone, and some people are on the webinar, and I don't know which one is, applies to Karen. Um, but for people who are on the webinar, I've just switched back to the additional resources page, and the third bullet point down is a link. I assume it's a live link um, to the keeping track document. Um, if that link doesn't work, just type into Google, Alliance for Justice Keeping Track. It'll pop right up. I just did it this morning, um, and it's a really useful tool. If there are no further questions, I think we shall conclude today's webinar. We are grateful for your interest in this topic. This is a very important role for nonprofit organizations, and we believe that policymaking will be better and stronger and serve the communities well if our nonprofit organizations' voices and their constituents are engaged. And we encourage your organization to think about ways to bring lobbying into your organization's strategies. And we certainly encourage you to be aware of and be strictly compliant with the laws and reporting requirements that apply to nonprofit organizations. Um, we're here as a resource for you. Please call us anytime. And good luck lobbying.